Hello, brothers. We are in Matthew chapter 13 today, and you may have noticed that I've done it to myself again. Uh, we have 52 <laughs> verses to study, um, but here's the exciting part. You'll notice as we go through this that God makes it clear through His Word that as we look here at the, the secret of God's kingdom or the secrets of His king, uh, in His kingdom of heaven, that we get the privilege, and by we, I mean you and me as members of Amen, living on this side of the cross, we get the privilege to understand the kingdom of God better than the prophets of the Old Testament and better than the disciples who were listening to Jesus as He shared these things. We get to understand these secrets of the kingdom, not just for knowledge, not just to fill our brains with something, but to transform our lives. With that said, what I'd love for you to do is to go ahead and pause uh, this recording and read all 52 verses, um, whether you're in a group or by yourself, and then go ahead and start the recording again uh, and come back uh, to join us. Let's go ahead and read the passage right now. Well, brothers, welcome back, and I hope that you were encouraged even as you read. Now, what are we going to, uh, to do with all this? Before we do anything, why don't we go ahead and pray and ask God to help us understand His Word as He promised to do if we seek Him. Heavenly Father, thank You for the beauty and power of Your Word, and we would ask, Lord, that uh, You would open these things up to us. We know it's You through your Holy Spirit that reveals these things to us. So, Heavenly Father, speak to us now, for your servants are listening. And all of us said, Amen. Well, there's some scripture introduction here, and we always have scriptural introduction, but today it's going to be a little more lengthy because I think we need to understand some things about this passage and about parables in general, Jesus' parables, so that uh, it makes more sense as we go through um, these eight parables. When you look at the parables of, that are here in this chapter, and that there's going to be some more in Matthew, as you look at them in Luke, as you look at them in Mark, um, you're going to understand a few things. First of all, you're going to want to understand that most are meant to illustrate just really one or a few truths using similes or metaphors. Um, from known things, from things that they would have understood, like, um, you know, you see here the things with wheat and tares and casting seed um, and understanding things like a, a finding something super valuable um, and, and knowing that that was important to get or, or from fishing a net. All of those things would have been kind of understood. And those similes or metaphors Jesus used to help understand uh, and illustrate just one or two things. So you don't have before us, the second thing I would say about parables, we don't have before us something that's completely an allegory. Uh, when we think of a, an allegory, we think more in terms of the way C.S. Lewis writes, for instance, in Chronicles of Narnia, where the way he writes, almost every detail is, is meant to have some meaning for us. Uh, we need to be careful when we look at par parables that Jesus wasn't using every single aspect of the of the parable to to display or to uh, to teach some particular uh, meaning. Uh, instead, there was us there's usually just a main point or maybe one or two main points of the parable. There's eight parables that we have before us in here in chapter 13, and they're all about as you can see they're all about the kingdom of heaven. Um, there's four of them. The first four. Uh, Jesus teaches to or speaks in front of the, the crowds, it says. And then later it says he withdraws from the crowds. And the last four, he speaks to just the disciples. And of course, the way that Matthew has arranged this, uh, he points out that there were times at which Jesus pulled away from the crowds and explained it or just spoke only to his disciples to explain the meaning of the parable of the weeds and the parable of the sower. The other thing we need to understand is that as Jesus speaks about the kingdom of God, the Jewish people would have understood kingdom of God, but they wouldn't have understood it in the way that Jesus would present it. And that's the point that Jesus is making. Their understanding of the kingdom of God was going to be this great political kingdom that was going to wipe out Rome and going to make Israel this great nation again. And Jesus has something else to say about the kingdom and how it's going to come on this earth. 
And why, why the secrets of this kingdom? Why the word secret? That's from verse 11 here in chapter 13, where it says, To you has been given the secrets of the kingdom. The Hebrew word there is mysterios, which of course we get the word mystery. Paul writes about that several times in his epistles when he talks about the things, uh, the mysteries uh, that have been made known in Christ. Uh, We shouldn't get um, frustrated with the word secret or mystery because what it means is something that is um, God's plan now revealed through his Holy Spirit to his people. So a secret is only a secret if not everybody knows it. And of course, not everybody does know the secrets of the kingdom. Not everybody does understand God's plan of salvation as it's been revealed from the start of the world. So those things are a mystery. Those things are secrets until God reveals them to us, reveals us his ways. So not all understand these parables, and that's made clear as Jesus speaks to his disciples and lets them know, even quoting from Isaiah, that not everybody's going to understand. So why does Jesus use them? Why does Jesus use parables if not everybody is going to grasp uh, their meaning? I love what D.A. Carson says about this. Uh, He said, Jesus spoke in parables not simply to convey information and also not to hide it or not to mask it. The reason Jesus spoke in parables was to challenge the hearers. And it did that both for those who didn't understand because they were challenged by the fact that they didn't quite grasp it. And maybe that brought a conviction upon them. It also was to challenge those of us who by the Holy Spirit would understand what Jesus was saying because it was a message about his kingdom that would confront maybe some issues in our own lives that we needed to deal with. I imagine that that's going to happen to us today. I pray that it happens for us, even as we study this chapter. And there's two things that hinder our understanding of God, of Jesus as he speaks, and certainly hinders the understanding of these parables. The first is this. Uh, if you reject the teacher, then you're not going to care to understand what he's teaching. You're going to reject his teaching. And certainly, uh, there were many that rejected Jesus as the teacher. And so they weren't interested in what he had to say. They didn't, they didn't care. They had already decided against him. That's what we see the Pharisees doing. And certainly in our day, and even in our time, and maybe at certain points in our lives, um, we have rejected the teacher. So in rejecting the teacher, of course, we didn't understand or rejected. we also rejected his teaching. The other thing that hinders the understanding of what Jesus is saying is, the, is not seeing the actions of the teacher. So one is rejecting the teacher. The other is not understanding or seeing the actions of the teacher. So Jesus makes it clear uh, there in, uh, in verses um, 34 uh, through, um, I guess, 34 through 35, that... The prophets didn't necessarily understand completely what Jesus was saying uh, or even what they were speaking. Uh, Excuse me, they didn't understand what Jesus was saying because (laughs) Jesus wasn't alive. But they didn't understand even some of the things they were prophesying about because they hadn't witnessed the Messiah coming. They were only seeing in the future by God's uh, um, design what was to come, but they didn't get to witness the actions of Christ, and the ultimate action being the cross. So in that way, even the disciples who are here walking with Jesus and listening to Jesus, seeing his miracles, still, because the cross hadn't happened, the death and the resurrection of Jesus hadn't happened yet, they didn't fully understand even the parables that Jesus was speaking to them as they were right there. And that's why, brothers, I would say to you and to me, on this side of the cross, we do understand Because we can not only see the teacher and and by the Spirit's working in us, receive him as the Christ, as the Messiah, but we also know the cross and we understand or at least see the resurrection. And in that way, we do not have to be hindered in understanding Jesus' teachings. So with those thoughts in mind and thinking about these parables, I would ask you, are you ready to be challenged today as we look 
quickly and briefly at these parables. Are you ready to be challenged about the nature of God's kingdom and your place and my place in it? Uh, Let's be ready. All right, brothers, and let's go as we look at these five things about the kingdom of God. Number one, the kingdom of God originates in the heart. Remember, the Jewish people were looking for a political kingdom. They were looking for, uh, for Israel to be made a great nation again and for their identity as, as Israelites, as Jewish people, to be established in an, in an outward way. And yet, when you look here at the parable of the sower in verses 1 through 23, the, that parable and the explanation of it, you understand as Jesus is speaking um, that this is, this is a heart issue. Also notice that this is ultimately not about the sower or where the seed is cast, but about the ground on which the seed is cast. So as the gospel goes out and the message of Christ goes out, it falls on these four types of grounds. And these four types of grounds are meant to to, um, describe the heart of those who hear them. And why do I say heart? It is a heart issue. Why do I say it's a heart issue? Because you can see there... In verses 15 and 19, that Jesus says it's a heart issue. In quoting uh, from Isaiah in verse 15, it says, um, Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart. And then on, uh, in, in verse, beginning at verse 18, when he's explaining the parable of the sower, he says in verse 19, When anyone hears the word of the kingdom, and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is a heart issue. And as you have read um, and maybe even been taught several times the parable of the sower, you know we have before us a, a hard heart, a shallow heart, a strangled heart, and an open heart. And the question for us, brothers, is what kind of heart do we have as the Word of God is taught to us, as the gospel has come to us? Do we have hard hearts that just won't listen and receive? Do we have shallow hearts that get excited and then have it all fizzle away because it never takes deep root into our lives? Do we have strangled hearts because of our wealth, because of the temptations around us, that we let those weeds and thorns grow up around us and they strangle the message of God, strangling the the message of the gospel? Or do we have open hearts where the gospel takes root in our lives and produces a fruit for the kingdom? And notice it's different different levels of fruit. It's not all the same. the, 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 what, what is produced in our lives. But what is all the same, not the amount, but the fact that, that fruit results when the gospel has taken root in our lives. Brothers, do we have open hearts for the kingdom? Because it's a heart issue and it begins in the heart. Secondly, we see in verses 24 through 30 and then the explanation of it in 36 through 43, the parable of the weeds, that as Christ is sowing his kingdom in the hearts of men and women, that the evil one is opposed to the kingdom, and he is sowing uh, among God's people those who would rebel against God. Um, He is working to destroy God's people, to destroy the kingdom from inside. That's why we say it's insidious, it's it's sneaky, it's... um, it's coming up from something that seems like eternal, and it's, and it's interwoven um, with uh, God's people, uh, and it's dangerous to the kingdom. We see that in the world around us. Uh, the, the whole issue of weeds is something that's real personal to me right now. Maybe it's real personal to you. Um, I've had this battle going on with my lawn uh, forever. Now, if you saw my lawn, you'd say, Todd, you're losing the battle because clearly you don't have a great lawn. Um, But I'm trying, brothers. I really am trying. Uh, But it seems like right when I figure out how to battle one kind of weed, um, some other kind of weed comes up. um, And and then I got to figure out even what it is because I'm not not very good at identifying the weeds. In fact, um, as you all know, sometimes, especially this time of year, uh, there's some weeds that look like grass. In fact, they, 
they look like really good grass. They look better than my grass uh, looks right now. I mean, it, it, they're greener than the real stuff. Um, and it confuses me. And I'm not sure what product to go buy at, at Lowe's or Home Depot to figure out how to battle this. Um, as I think about this parable, I think about that reality. Um, and, and I would say the conviction in my life sometimes is, Todd, make sure you're not a weed yourself. Make sure you're not being used um, by the evil one uh, to, to insidiously, to in a sneaky way, um, go ahead and, and in any way uh, uh, strangle or, or cause issue with um, the kingdom of God, with God's people. Um, now I'm thankful that like with the sower, um, that Jesus explains this particular um, uh, parable because I think otherwise um, we could really get off track here. In fact, it seems to me that, that uh, some of us who've taught this in, in you know, for the, <laughs> well, really for the last 2,000 years, sometimes have gotten off track because we haven't just looked at what Jesus said this is about. And I think at the core of it, we need to understand that Jesus is explaining the re reason evil still exists. Um, remember that he was trying to explain the kingdom to these Jewish people who thought the kingdom would be this political domination in which Jesus, the Messiah, would come and would make Israel a great nation and, and instantly we would be very aware of who was part of the kingdom and who was not and, uh, and it would be sudden and it would happen right away. But Jesus here is clearly making the point that there's going to be a time in which um, uh, his people, the people of the kingdom and the people of the evil one will exist together. He doesn't want us to get discouraged in that, but he wants to remind us that God is in control. And though it's opposed by an insidious enemy, um, he is going to accomplish his purposes. The kingdom is marching forward. The third thing that we see here in Matthew chapter 13, is that the kingdom has small beginnings, but those small beginnings should not be misunderstood as meaning that it's a small kingdom or that it's a weak kingdom. And here we have the, uh, um, the, two, the two parables of the mustard seed and the leaven. Um, and this could be a little confusing um, because it seems like that, you know, with the parable of the weeds, we're talking about this insidious opposition to the, um, the kingdom of God. And then at the same time, you think of other places where it talks about uh, leaven or yeast. It seems to always, it almost always, it seems to be speaking about something negative. That you, you wouldn't want to have leaven, you wouldn't want to have yeast. That's a, that's a bad thing. That represents sin. Uh, so some have, have argued that maybe what's being said here is a continuation of Jesus' thoughts here regarding this insidious um, uh, opposition or this opposition by this insidious enemy. But if you look over to the book of Mark um, and to the book of Luke, Gospel of Mark, Gospel of Luke, and you see these parables there, I actually would agree with, with many scholars that would say, no, I think it's fine to see this in regards to the kingdom of heaven in a, in a positive way. So the key here about the mustard seed, um, well, first of all, let's be clear, mustard seeds don't grow into trees. Um, they grow into large shrubs. Uh, but the point here is not what it grows into, but that it actually goes from being something that's considered extremely small to being something that is very large. So how does this small thing become something that is so large? And in the same way, this yeast, this, this just a little bit, just a little bit of yeast put into dough makes its way through the entire dough. And so as um, Jesus was speaking to these Jewish people who were waiting for this huge inauguration of the kingdom that the Messiah would come in power and he would overthrow Rome, uh, Jesus was making it clear, listen, it's happening now, it's beginning small and someday the fullness of what you know see and see prophesied in the book of Isaiah and other prophets, that's going to happen. But don't misunderstand these small beginnings for a small kingdom. It's going to be a huge kingdom. In fact, 
when you when you look at the parable of the seed, the mustard seed, the point is that there's going to be extensive growth by the kingdom of God. And in our lifetimes, 2,000 years later, we've already seen that, haven't we? We continue to see that. Sometimes we feel like we don't see it in our own country or our own city or our own neighborhoods. But brothers, when you hear about what's going on in China, when you hear about what's going on in India, when you hear what's going on in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, you understand that God's kingdom is always growing. There is just massive growth and it's crossing cultural boundaries and ethnic boundaries and it has for 2,000 years. And God is saving people daily. God is saving people. And not only that, but as you understand the, the point of the parable of the leaven or the yeast, uh, you understand that this represents uh, the kingdom's going to involve intensive transformation. So it's not just that it's, it's growing in the number of people that are, are saved, but as you watch what God is doing in the hearts of men and women, it's transforming people. And it's, and it's, a, it's an a, intensive transformation. And when it transforms people, it starts to transform neighborhoods. And when it transforms neighborhoods, it transforms cities. And when it transforms cities, it transforms cultures. And we've seen that in different times in history, uh, throughout the world, we're seeing it in different parts of the world right now. Maybe if we're not even seeing it in our country, in our country right now, we're seeing it in other places. And yet, we pray for it here, don't we? We pray that it would start the intensive transformation, which started in our own hearts, and that that intensive transformation would then spill out into our neighborhoods, into our workplaces, into our schools, into our cities. Not through legislation, not through a, some political power, but through the Holy Spirit changing the hearts and minds of men and women, our friends, and beginning with us, that we would be men who would be transformed by the gospel. Um, extensive growth, intensive transformation, that that would begin with us. Do we believe this, brothers? Will we trust the Lord to bring His kingdom in His time, even as in our day it seems like things are going backwards in the place that we live? And will we trust the, the, the message of the kingdom, the nature of God's kingdom as revealed in Christ, even in these parables? Or will we be like the Jewish people who are his hearers at the time, who just want some kind of political, cultural kingdom? Uh, how will we respond in our time when we face this sense of small beginnings uh, and, and marginalized even by culture. Um, you know, this past week, I think it was past week or two weeks ago, the um, Gallup poll came out uh, revealing that for the first time, certainly in our lifetime, maybe over a hundred years, maybe ever, um, that the number of people, the percentage, excuse me, of people in the United States who um, say that they're a, a member of a church is less than 50% for the first time since I think any polls have been taken. And so we're seeing um, that something is going on in our culture which all of a sudden makes the church feel marginalized or small. And this is a great word for us. Um, God is working. God is going to do what He needs to do. And though there's small beginnings, um, we, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't worry or fret. Instead, we should be seeking the Lord and praying that He would bring His kingdom to come in our lives, in our homes, in our neighborhoods, and in this city. Well, fourthly, this kingdom is worth everything that you and I have. Absolutely everything. We see that in the, uh, the two parables in verses 44 through 46, the parable of the hidden treasure and the parable of the pearl of great value. Um, it's interesting to note as you look at these two parables that both of them, though speaking of the great value of the kingdom, one of them, the hidden treasure, is a surprise. Um, he wasn't looking for hidden treasure. Uh, he just found it. Um, and having stumbled across it, he recognized its value and sold everything he, he had in order to get it. The other one, uh, the pearl, was something that was being sought. Um, the merchant was in search of fine pearls, and when he found it, he understood its value. And 
uh, and, and went and wanted to, to sell everything he had to be able to get this. Uh, the point of it is this, um, that the gospel is that hidden treasure. The gospel is that pearl. Ultimately, the relationship with Christ is that treasure. The relationship with Christ is that pearl. Some of you, your testimony is that you were never really seeking it. You stumbled across it and the Lord revealed himself to you and you understood what a great treasure this was. Others of you, there was some seeking going on. You were looking for purpose. You were looking to understand religion. Maybe you were looking to to debunk (laughs) uh, Christ in his gospel. Um, And then you discover, and you were looking for pearls of truth, and then you discovered the truth, the great pearl of value that is a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And when that happens, it's, you, you realize it's worth everything. It's worth everything I have, everything that I am, everything that I ever considered part of my identity, part of whatever brought me pleasure. Uh, it, it means everything, and, and I have to give myself to that relationship because it means so much. It's so valuable to me. It reminds me of when Paul speaks about his relationship with Christ in Philippians chapter 3. Remember, he says after he lists all the things that he was, all the prestige that he had, all the things that brought him identity and value in life. And then he says, um, when he thinks of all those things, he goes, I consider everything, all that list, everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. In fact, he says, I consider it all a pile of manure. Like, I think it's useless, Uh, more than useless, compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. And so the loss of those things, he says, it means nothing to me because I've gained Christ. Um, And being found in him, I want to know him, he says. I want to know the power of resurrection. I want to know the fellowship of sharing in sufferings. I want to give up everything for that. Another place in Galatians, he says, um, but I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. I have given up all those things, all of who I was. And now Christ lives in me and the life I now live, I live by faith in this one who saved me. Is that our testimony, brothers? Are we willing daily to give up everything? Will we give up those sinful pleasures? Will we Will we give those up in order to gain the treasure of a relationship with Jesus Christ? Now, be clear that you know, this is where you don't want to make it an allegory where every little thing has a point. Because Jesus is not saying that we earn our salvation or that we earn our relationship with Him. That's not the point. The point is that the relationship with Christ is of such great value that it's worth selling everything, giving up everything everything, our sins, our prejudices, our comforts in life, giving up our pride, giving up our right to justice, giving up our right to be right, um, giving up our place, giving up even our future, that we would be willing to give up everything for the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus as our Lord and Savior, that that would be our great blessing. And then finally, brothers, um, this kingdom, is its consummation is coming. Um, that's the point, really, of the last uh, two parables, certainly the one about the net. Uh, but let me speak to the, the one in verses 51 and 52 in regards to the master of the house. The consummation of this kingdom is coming. Remember, the Jewish hearers were wanting that political kingdom, wanting... wanting you know, the, the government to be overthrown and uh, wanting God's kingdom to be set up in a, in a political and an economic way in that place in order that they might gain that prestige. And what Jesus was presenting didn't seem like the kingdom that they were expecting. Um, but Jesus then also says, listen, there is a consummation that's coming. There is a point at which um, all of this will come to its fulfillment. Um, where all of these things will be made known. And when that happens, there's going to be a dividing. Um, There, 
uh, here in this passage, the word judgment here really means uh, a dividing. And you can see there, the angels are dividing um, the good fish from the bad fish. Uh, and that's the point, um, that there is a judgment to come, that this kingdom will have a consummation in place. There's this great book called Living Life Backwards, uh, written by David Gibson. Um, it's, not a, it's not a big book. Um, it is basically a commentary on the book of Ecclesiastes. In fact, if you are a member of the Sojourner CC, um, myself along with uh, Larry Jensen, we're going to be teaching um, through um, the book of Ecclesiastes using uh, David Gibson's book, Living Life Backwards. Um, and what I love about that book is that, that uh, Gibson points out that when we really understand what life is all about and understand the kingdom of God and its coming consummation and what really is valuable in the kingdom of God, what really the whole world has been created for, economies and, and political structures and everything, where this is going, when we know the end... It helps us to look backwards and to reorient our lives now to live in a way that reflects the reality of the end. That's what he means by living life backwards. And I think the challenge for us, even as we, uh, as followers of Christ, looking at these, this parable of the net, would be a recognition that there is a judgment coming, not that we are in fear of the judgment, but to understand that God's kingdom will finally come in its fullness. And that is what is going to happen. Am I living now in a way that reflects an expectation of that kingdom? Is that how I'm conducting my business? Is that how I'm conducting my family? Are those the values I've set for my kids or my grandkids? Are those the values I've set even for my pleasures and my leisure? Are those the values that I've set in regards to how I spend my time? Am I living life backwards? Am I looking at the consummation of the kingdom and going, I know this is coming now. How will I live my life? What steps am I going to take to move towards that moment when Christ returns and his kingdom comes in its fullness? And if you don't know Christ... If you don't have a relationship with Christ, then these words of Christ are meant to challenge you. There is a judgment coming. God is not simply going to overlook and say, you know what, we're, we're all good. Um, in fact, as, as one pastor I recently heard said, uh, unconditional love does not mean unconditional acceptance of our behavior. He say that again, unconditional love does not mean unconditional acceptance of our behavior. Part of what we celebrated this last week in the death and the resurrection of Jesus was the reality that there had to be a payment for our sin. That God doesn't just overlook our sin and say, oh, you know, that's okay, we're good. No, there had to be payment. And so God in His love makes payment with his own son's blood in order that you and I might be forgiven of all our sins, in order that there might be justice. So the judgment that was to be on us has fallen on him if we accept Christ as our salvation, if we rest our faith on him. If we don't, then the judgment falls on us. Then the coming judgment is going, to, is going to be on us. And that's the choice. It's either on Christ in his death and resurrection and offered to us in the gospel. Or if you reject that and don't receive it, then it's on you. And you will stand under the wrath of God on your own. But here's the free gift of the gospel. And I would say, if you've never received Christ, receive Him today. Receive Him now. Make Him your own right now. Pause, sit down, or kneel down and pray, Lord, come into my life. I want to rest my life completely in You because there is a consummation of this kingdom and there will be a judgment. And so, even as we look at this last parable, the parable of 
the master's house. And why do I say it's a parable? Because it has the same structure as the others. It says, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house. So there it is, a small little parable. And it says he brings out a, from his treasure what is new and what is old. What is the point of that? A treasure that is old and new. The point of it is this. Jesus is saying this kingdom was always the plan. It was the plan of the Old Testament. That is why Jesus, as he preaches, what is he preaching? He's preaching the fulfillment of the Old Testament. He's preaching the promises that were made in the Old Testament. He's preaching the truths of God revealed in the Old Testament. He's te teaching the typology that existed in the Old Testament. That's what we talked about a couple weeks ago. And so the old is not something that's to be rejected or didn't matter. Or isn't, no, it was always showing the kingdom. This is the, as we call it, the ark of salvation or, or salvation history. And from the moment when man is created in the garden until Christ returns and brings in his kingdom, this is all one story, though there seems to be old and new. And so as this kingdom is coming, we realize we've been told about it all along. It is the, the arc of history. It is the point of history. Well, brothers, we are now 13 chapters into the Gospel of Matthew. And as we said at the very beginning, this Gospel uh, it says a whole lot about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. That's what Matthew wants to get the point across to his hearers, that Jesus is the king and that he has a kingdom. And here in chapter 13, we have before us uh, so many um, uh, words, eight parables to contemplate uh, the kingdom of God and what that means for us as we live our lives. And the challenge before us is not to just take this in as head knowledge, but to have it transform our lives. So the challenge before us is this, brothers. Will we live this week and the rest of our lives, but beginning this week, will we live this week as men of the kingdom who have listened to the words that Jesus has spoken and by the power of the Spirit understood those things and then have them transform our lives so that as we live, we live as men of the kingdom. Let's pray to that end, brothers. Heavenly Father, thank you for this study um, and thank you for um, these parables, these pictures of the kingdom. May you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, teach us that these truths that you wanted to reveal to us. And having uh, received the teacher and not rejected Christ, having understood or at least seen through God's word, through these gospels, having seen the actions of the teacher ultimately in the death and the resurrection and the ascension of Christ. Father, may we be transformed by this, that we might live as men of the kingdom. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, brothers. You have a great week.